So good evening, everybody. I hope you can all hear me nice and clearly. Yeah, that's um, fine. Lovely. Wonderful. Thank you, Maria. Um, do forgive me if I start coughing and spluttering. I've got a bit of a funny cough. Um, and also my apologies for not being able to do this earlier last year, as Maria says, I was called away um, at very, very short notice to a police investigation which very pleasingly resulted ultimately in the suspect getting a very, very lengthy custodial sentence for a uh, very, very nasty series of activities. So um, I'm back now in the world of London botany, not forensic botany for this evening. Um, and I'm going to finish off the series of talks by talking about wetlands, aquatic habitats, um, and frankly, overall, the pretty parlous state of them um, in the London area, um, which is reflecting a very, very long series of events over the last few centuries, massive pollution events, the city being, the river being killed, and then obviously more recently, we're going through the uh, sewage fiasco. Um, and so I'll start off with this image of um, an iconic piece of modern London's landscape, um, partly is to centre ourselves, because it's fair to say the Thames is without a doubt the most significant wetland um, in the London area. Um, but it is most definitely not the wetland it was 2000 or more years ago because centuries of urbanisation have resulted in the River Thames becoming, like many other urban rivers globally, narrower, deeper, faster, murkier, and frankly more polluted in many cases, even with improvements in river quality through much of the 20th century, um, despite the downturn of late. Um, and this has actually had very, very significant impacts upon the flora of the River Thames and consequently um, upon actually the well-being of other parts of the ecosystem, fisheries, invertebrates, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and just to illustrate this point, I'm going to show you this delightful image of one of, you know, one of the world's most beloved and iconic group of plants, one of the water lilies. Uh, water lilies are found pretty much globally in aquatic habitats, um, both in the tropics and temperate regions. Um, and we have two species of water lily in Britain. We have Nymphaea alba, which is one of the parent species of most of the horticultural water lilies that you see in, by you buy in your garden centre. And the other one is the yellow water lily, um, Nufa. Now, the reason I've got this image up is actually to just highlight actually how very much London's river, you know, the Thames and the other rivers, frankly, have changed. Because Nymphaea alba is um, at the moment still recognised to be a nationally pretty common species and not risk of extinction. But we have lost it from virtually everywhere as a truly wild plant in the greater London area. Um, now, some of the ways we know this is through, um, frankly, is through qualitative information. So if you go back four or five hundred years, there are commentaries and, and records and people discussing and talking about having sailed down the River Thames or pulled their boat up on the side of the River Thames and the river being full of water lilies. So we know as recently as um, the mid 18th century, white water lily grew quite close to Fulham Palace, for example. So the river has changed massively. It has become too fast, too turbid for plants, particularly the yellow or the white water lily, my apologies, which is very, very intolerant of damage from boats. Because unlike the yellow plant, um, it doesn't have submerged leaves. All of its leaves are on the surface which makes it very, very, very prone to damage, um, particularly with motorised boats today. Whereas the yellow water lily has leaves which are both floating, but also submerged, and therefore it can tolerate a little bit more of the rigours of the modern urban aquatic life. Nevertheless, both species are, it appears, declining in the London area, particularly as use of the aquatic environment for recreation has increased significantly on our canals. Um, and I'm actually not entirely sure 
we have any truly wild water lily, white water lily that is, um, anywhere in probably certainly in the inner London boroughs and maybe even on the outer London boroughs. Um, the records are very confusing because a lot of the time people don't actually know the difference between the garden cultivars, the garden hybrids and the truly wild plant because frankly it can be quite tricky. So the status of this wild plant actually in the London area is actually rather questionable. Which comes back to uh, one of the themes I'm going to be talking about, which is part of my life and activity as the recorder for the LNHS and the BSBI in Middlesex is mapping the flora of the London area. Um, and I've gone through this map and talked about it in the past, but it's always good to recap. And for those people who are not familiar, um, this is my territory and the London Natural Histories territory. So the red outline you can see in the middle is the current outline of uh, Greater London, as it is now known. Um, and the city of London is lurking right pretty much in the middle um, in the centre of the image. Um, and you'll notice around that there is a larger circle, and that is the uh, the area that is covered by the London Natural History Society in terms of our walks, talks, visits and botanizing and birding and insecting, et cetera, et cetera. So this is our area of interest. But much of the work I've been doing has been principally within the modern Greater London. And layered on top of these are the other elements of my life as a botanist in the London area. And these are the vice counties. And this is a system which has existed since the mid 19th century. Um, it was devised by a man called Hewitt Cottrell Watson. And it's a means of separating, segregating the parts of Britain and Ireland um, into a series of geographic areas now called vice counties. So Cornwall, for example, is vice county one and two. Um, and the map you're looking at here, we've actually got in the bottom left hand side is Surrey, which is 17, then West Kent, which is next to it, which is 18. And then if we go over the River Thames, which is snaking through the middle, we have the bottom part of Essex, South Ethic, Essex. Nautily, North Essex is mixed out, missed out because it does come into this area. Then we have Hertfordshire directly above, which is VC20. Buckinghamshire to the left, 24, and my vice county, Middlesex, is actually much of the core of North and West London, as we now know it. And the county of Middlesex is uh, one of the smallest county vice counties in Britain. Oh, my screen's frozen for some reason. Ah, there we go. So I just want to show you this in another thing. I've shown to people this many times, um, but it's just an, a way of actually representing it and seeing it for a different perspective. <laughs> here we have again on the right hand side, I'm not going to talk about the left hand image, the vice counties. And here's my vice county, Middlesex, 21, a county which no longer exists. Now, the act of botanizing is about pleasure, it's about exploring plant life and studying, but it is important, importantly also about actually really documenting change. Um, and this is important for us as natural historians, but also increasingly it's critical evidence for our society in terms of how threats of extinction are rising and also the impact of major things such as invasive species and climate change. So currently at the moment at the London Natural History Society, I'm leading and coordinating a long and sometimes arduous and painful project, which is called the London Flora Project, which will probably take some 20 years because on average, a flora, i.e. an account of plant life in an area, takes about that. Um, and we are not the first people to do it in the London area. Um, or in any of the individual vice counties, and many vice counties will have a list of county floras or historical floras that were worked on over the last couple of centuries or so. So here are two of my key sources for my area for London is the historical flora of Middlesex and then the supplement that was published in 2000. 
Um, and this is a rich PM source of information for understanding not only the presence or absence of plants in, in any ge given geographic area, but also actually qualitative things, what's happening to them, whether they're abundant at location, whether there's information about whether somebody quietly introduced them without telling them, all these kind of pieces of useful information are valuable. So the current London Flora Project is actually doing its best to revise and review this particular piece of work, which is Rodney Burton's Flora of the London Area. This in itself, um, published in 1983, was actually based upon data collected in the mid 60s to the mid 1970s. So you can show that actually even from this particular work, there's an arc of some 20 plus years to go from collecting observations on a one kilometre square basis, as we're attempting to at the moment, to produce, producing a finished flora. And the flora will have maps inside it, or fairly typically a flora will have maps in it, with a brief account describing the status of the plant, what's happening to it, is it common or rare, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So producing a flora is very valuable and it helps us understand the status of plants in all sorts of habitats, or in this particular case, the aquatic environment. Um, so here I'm going to start off with a rather delightful image from one of the uh, world's most celebrated botanical artists, Dute, and this depicts a plant called starfruit. Now, uh, this is a plant which will quicken the heart of many a botanist in pretty much the whole of Western Europe, um, because this species is actually severely at risk of extinction globally. Um, there are very, very few places in Western Europe where it's holding out and doing reasonably well. There's one or two areas in France and also one or two areas in Spain. But overall, um, its range is contracting and its populations are collapsing. Um, and it's fair to say that the same has happened in this spe in this country. This species was never common. It was never widespread. It was largely restricted to Anstilles, to southeast England, Surrey, Middlesex, and um, Hampshire and places like that. And Damazonium's part of its rarity is down to the fact that it's actually really rather a curious and very specialist plant. Um, each one of these plants is usually maximum sort of 15, 20 centimetres high, and that's big. They're usually considerably smaller, sometimes only five centimetres or so. Um, and they are specialists of living on the edge of relatively nutrient poor, um, lowland pools, often in areas adjacent to heathland, um, in areas which have been poached, i.e. trodden, by things like cattle coming in to drink at the edge of the water, because this plant needs open ground to allow its starry fruit, the seeds within, to germinate and grow. So it has a very, very specialist ecology. Um, and it's fair to say the modern world is not very forgiving of aquatic plants with specialist ecologies. Um, so this species is now pretty much on life support system um, in Britain. There's, I think, about two populations which are doing reasonably well last time I checked. Um, and this is a species which sadly is now extinct in the London area. Um, it was at one time found in Hounslow Heath in the west of London. Um, and Hounslow Heath, we tend to hear the word heathland and think of relatively high and dry landscapes, but we have wet heathlands as well. The New Forest area, for example, exemplifies that, but parts of Dorset as well, where heathlands are pretty wet, pretty damp, boggy uh, and these support really really important community plants and Hounslow Heath back in the day in the 17th century had a list of plant rarities that would easily have outpace um, the greatest botanical sites of the new forest of today. So this is a species which is sadly no longer a Londoner uh, and it's also fair to say that it's extremely unlikely that this species will return because not only does it need this cattle poaching, and we don't have many cattle in our landscapes in the London area today, but it also needs to not be an environment saturated in, in, in nitrogen and phosphates, because the presence of nitrogen and phosphates, be that from dog wee, dog poo, 
car traffic, air car traffic or agricultural pollutants favours the growth of vigorous nitrophile plants and this species just simply cannot compete. And this is a fate that has befallen uh, many of our smaller and more delicate wetland and heathland species. On the right hand side, we have Cyperus fuscus, um, and this is a member of the sedge family. Um, and Cyperus fuscus has a similar, certainly in the UK, a similar range to, um, to Damazonium, and it has similar habitat requirements. It likes open poached ground on the edge of ponds. Um, and again, there are not many sites left for this species in southern England, um, and it may possibly still persist in one place in the far southwest, um, in a place called Shortwood Common. Uh, however, it hasn't been seen now for about 15 years, because frankly, the quality of the habitat has declined quite severely. Um, and it is also being very negatively impacted by invasive plant species, which are closing up the landscape and preventing this small specialist sedge brown gallingale from germinating. Other species have been lost, as I say, through how we have changed the ebb and flow and also the available marginal land of the River Thames itself. So on the left hand side, we have Schoenoplectus triquita. Um, and this is a rather fabulous, and again, another member of the sedge family called triangular club rush with very, very distinctive stems, which are strongly triangular, hence its name. Once more, this is a species which is on the brink of extinction in Britain um, and isn't doing too well in other parts of Western Europe either. Um, and there are at the moment literally one or two tiny populations on the Devon Dorset, Devon Dorset, Devon Cornwall border of the River Tamar um, down in southwest England. This species was up until about the 1920s locally frequent through parts of what is now central London. This was a plant that could be found. Um, along the Thames in one of parts of areas around not far away from Parliament, uh, the Isle of Dogs, which has gone through major development. Most of these habitats were um, concreted in and built up with hard standing, which meant the plant lost ground through that. And the remaining graded and, and slightly tidal habitat um, that was remained became faster flowing, dirtier and muddier and the plant found it harder and harder to survive. The last population of this species on the River Thames was her rather ironically found um, not far from Kew Gardens um, just by uh, Kew Bridge and the population was sadly destroyed when Kew Bridge was rebuilt and restructured in 1949. So we have lost this species as well. Um, so I talked about some of the historic losses, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about how some of our wetland plants are doing um, in the London area. But going to start off with the national context. Um, there has been, and some of you may be aware of this, has been a national activity called the BSBI Atlas 2020 project, which was a national scale version of what I've been talking about in the London area. Uh, whereby botanists have gone out and recorded plants the length and breadth of Britain and Ireland. Uh, and one of the species of plants which I'm very fond of and very into, or the groups rather, apologies, are the pondweeds, the potamogetans, which means water friend. And potamogetans are extraordinary plants because each individual species has quite a strong particular habitat preference. Uh, and is often strongly indicative of certain types of water quality. Is it acidic or alkaline, nutrient poor, nutrient rich, fast flowing or very still? So you can actually look at a water body and the presence or absence of certain types of potamogeton can give you a very, very strong understanding of what the status of that water body is. And this particular one here, um, the broadleaf pondweed, Potamogeton natans, is one of our most widespread species. Um, and you can see from the bottom down here, uh, on the bottom right hand side, there's some arrows pointing downwards, which are giving us some bad news, that despite the fact that this species is 
widespread still on a national scale, it does appear to be declining quite severely, um, particularly in Britain, but also in Ireland, um, through some of the damaging process that we talked about. Um, and the same is also true for the London area. Here is uh, a piece of uh, broadleaf pondweed, Potomagee natans. Uh, I think this photograph is possibly the last time I have seen this plant growing on the River Lee um, in East London. And the River Lee, um, for those of you who are not particularly familiar with the geography of London, is one of the tributary rivers into the River Thames flowing from the north down south um, into, into the River Thames. It's a very, very important waterway because it is relatively speaking one of the more intact of the Thames's tributaries. Um, it still has a relatively natural flow. It's been very heavily canalised, but it has also been very, very heavily impacted both in the past and currently with industrial pollution, agricultural pollution, and more recently, uh, the impacts of leisure crafts and people moving onto the canals for somewhere to live. So this is a species, because like the water lilies, it has a large leaf that floats on the surface, is very, very vulnerable to damage from lots of human activity. Um, so this species, despite the national picture being widespread, does seem to be declining. Um, and just to show you the, uh, the, the status of things, and it's actually, I've got to put up another set of maps for this in the future. These are the broadleaf pondweed records for the London area. There are 765 records, and that's actually both showed reflected in this map on the left hand side. 765 maps are, is not as it stands now. That is as known and recorded, frankly, over the last three to four hundred years. So at this particular time, there are probably 50 or 60 records because in virtually the vast majority of these sites, this species has now been lost. So we're fairly confident that not only the local abundance, but the number of occurrences for this species has declined quite radically. Um, and here is the more recent depiction of this. This is our, our the post-1999 records for 221. Many of these will be, oops, excuse me. My apologies, I just pulled my headphones out. Um, many of these will actually be from the same sites, these multiple records. And those, um, the many of these sites already, we know this species is lost. <laughs> I'm going to return to um, uh, Potomageetons a little bit later on with some, some good news. Um, so I'm going to carry on though for the time being in bad news vein. Another species which is nationally from an aquatic habitat point of view is not doing at all well is the lesser water plantain and the lesser water plantain is is a relative of the star fruit and has a similar ecology um, it tends to grow in shallow pools and damp and um, damp ground next to ponds um, <coughs> sorry and once again, if you look at the national mapping scheme, this this actually is all available online. So if you Google BSBI online plant atlas, you can take a look at the data yourself because this is all publicly available. The darker dots on this map are where we know that it's still or believe it still exists. Um, and the paler dots are where there's no confirmed records in recent years. We have one dot for the London area down here in the southeast. Um, and that one dot, oops, that's my excuse me, um, persists this day. This particular map has got a couple of additional dots on here, but I believe these sites are almost certainly now extinct as well. So here we have the lesser water plantain. Um, it has a flower which is very, very similar to Elysma, um, the, um, the common water plantain, which people are sometimes familiar with. It's quite a large aquatic plant. But this plant, before you get overexcited, is a little low thing that usually only grows about this high. There has one tiny population surviving in a tiny, tiny piece of relics land just off the North Circular um, in the Finchley part of London, uh, where I last saw it about 10 years ago. 
I'm very, very fearful that if I go back to this site, the species might not be there anymore or may be doing very, very badly. I'm going to move tempo a little bit and talk about um, habitats and what expectations you might have for important or valuable habitats. Uh, as a society, we tend to kind of look at the natural environment through rose tinted glasses and we look at pristine chalkland or beautiful mountain streams. Um, actually, in the London area, some of our best habitats, or up until relatively recently, are often in highly unexpected places. And this is the Barbican Lake. Um, and the Barbican Lake is a fascinating or was frankly a fascinating lake because when I first visited it some 15 years ago I had no expectations for this being interesting because it's a very very man-made environment it's surrounded by tower blocks and 20th century and 21st century living um, and very very far away from the wider natural environment at the time of my visit and for quite a few years afterward this site was probably one of the best quality lakes in the London area for aquatic life. The water quality was very, very high because apparently it was fed by a borehole. Um, and there was a diverse range of submerged aquatic plants, including a thing called Zanichelia, which is very uncommon in the London area, and a range of stoneworts, caraphytes, which are algal group of plants. Um, which are often really, really good indicators of interesting or good quality waters. So this is an image of uh, the Barbican Lake as it was about 10 years ago. I visited about three days ago um, and was most disheartened to see the lake quality has collapsed. Um, something is going very, very seriously wrong um, and the aquatic plant life has crashed, I suspect, because all I could see was a thick green algal soup and also at times methane bubbling up from the bottom of the water. So unfortunately this particular lake is no longer the uh, jewel in the city's crown that it once was. So I've emphasised you know significant change, you know the River Thames becoming faster and narrower and you know uh, loss frankly in water quality in places like the Barbican Lake there are still remnants of good quality marginal aquatic vegetation in our London areas. This is one of my favourite. This is Tripcot Ness, um, which is in the east of London um, and southeast of London. And this is a fascinating place because it gives us a window into what the marginal Thames vegetation may well have looked several hundred years ago in the foreground. We have a uh, sea club rush because this particular area is also is on the margin of where there's enough salt coming into the environment from the North Sea and the channel that it actually affects the salinity of the River Thames. This is a really, really important habitat and site. Actually, in the background here, there are some native black poplar, which I will return to. Um, to comment on a little bit later. So Tripcot Ness is a, a wonderful and still sadly threatened site and one of the very few places in the Greater London where we can see a transition from muddy foreshore into vegetation and into you know higher and drier ground. Other notable place for this is Sion Park in West London, which we will be visiting to do a survey to look for some important um, and very rare aquatic plants as part of the LNHS and, Bot and London Natural History, sorry, got there, part of the LNHS and BSBI summer programme of walks. So please do join us if you can. Uh, all the details are on the website. Oop. Sticking with the tidal Thames itself, this is myself and a friend quite a few years ago looking at what could possibly be described as London's only salt marsh. Um, this is on the mouth of the River Darrant, another important tributary of the River Thames. Um, I mentioned the River Lee earlier on. One thing I forgot to say is that most of the other rivers further to the west from the River Lee and the Darrant that pass through Greater London have been very, very strongly impacted, either by completely being covered over, such as the River Fleet, or heavily channelized or damaged by pollution, such as the River Brent, for example. So this little tiny patch of ground here 
um, I can lay claim with a long bit that is just further to the other side as to being possibly London's only salt marsh habitat. Um, there are several salt marsh species, including salicornia, um, uh, glasswort, saltwort growing there, and uh, several other species. Um, and including this rather drab little thing here on the left hand side, slender hare's ear, Bupleurum tenuissimum. This is a member of the carrot family um, and it's in fruit here in this thing. Uh, and then to the right, we have Aster tripolium, um, or tripolium panonicum as it now is. Now, one of the reasons I've put these two plants up is because they're also rather unusual compared to many of our coastal wetland plant species. So one of the things that's been happening is very interesting with the distribution of a lot of coastal plants over the last 30 years or so, is that many of them have been moving inland along motorways, main roads, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, because they're finding a new habitat to move into through road salting. So the main roads of Britain are becoming like extra pieces of salt marsh for many of these species. Curiously, slender hairs here and sea aster have not really done that. And we're not quite sure why. It's probably something to do with their capacity for dispersal or maybe their ability to establish in these habitats. Um, slender hairs here is a species which is showing a fairly significant decline, um, whereas C. aster seems to be doing reasonably well, thankfully. Oh, excuse me. And just to show you that is it how I, actually a map can give you a little and a reasonably subtle hint about actually the extent or location of uh, the River Thames in the London area. Here we have the map for Tripolium panonicum. And as I say, with all records over the last couple of hundred years or so, 202. But this species does appear to be increasing slowly. So I'm going to move away from uh, the River Thames um, and move further west and away from salinity um, and talk about um, a common widespread plant, um, which is often overlooked, but is actually always quite a nice indicator of a good quality habitat in the London area. And that's silverweed, Potentilla anzorina, this delightful, pretty common plant, very, very strongly associated with wetland habitats and damp ground, um, underappreciated. But this is a species which is always good to keep an eye out for, because if you find this, you may find less frequent plants growing in the vegetation. And it also seems to thrive quite well um, under the grazing pressure of um, Canada geese, amongst other things. Um, Canada geese in lots of Britain and Ireland get a very bad rap as a non-native invasive species. But um, I'm, a, I'm a, a bit of a heretic on this. I actually think probably in the London area, in some habitats, they're actually quite beneficial. Because as I say, across the board, London is being heavily impacted by a nutrient pollution in the form of car pollution, airplane pollution, agricultural pollution. Canada geese are wonderful grazers, and even though they do poop all over the place, they keep the grassland on the sides of certain lakes and ponds nice and short and provide a habitat for some species of plant which are not capable of dealing with the growth of the big burly beasts such as nettles. So nettles, um, we tend to askew, you know, they sting us, they're not very exciting, um, but actually here's an exciting nettle for you to look at. This is the fen nettle. Um, and what's exciting about the fen nettle is, A, it's very, very big compared to the normal stinging nettle, Urtica dioca. It can sometimes be two, three metres tall. It tends to have rather long, elegant, willowy leaves, unlike the widespread form. Um, but critically, it is almost entirely stingless. So you can grab hold of the fen nettle and you're not going to suffer great pain. You might get the odd sting, but nothing much at all. And in some individuals, you'll get nothing. It does not sting at all. Now, fen nettle is interesting plant The reason for two reasons. First of all, why is it not stinging? The prevailing theory is that because it is, grows in very, very wet habitats, um, on the edges of marshes and fenlands, it grows in areas which are out of reach and out of pres the presence of large grazing animals. So therefore, it does not need to have the sting response to protect itself from grazing. 
because nettles have been nutritious. Um, we're not quite sure whether that's absolutely true. That's the prevailing theory, and it seems to fit quite well as a common sense model. Um, the other thing about fen nettle is certainly interesting in the London area is that it seems to be restricted to remnant ancient pieces of landscape. Landscape. We find it along parts of an area called the River Cold in West London and a few other places that have, broadly speaking, escaped the horrors and, uh, and damage that we have done over the last 200 years or so. Oops. <clears throat> So I just want to do it. <laughs> excuse me. Hmm. Talk momentarily about uh, a couple of classic plants, um, but from very different perspectives. The yellow flag iris is probably the most one of the most emblematic plants of wetland habitats. Um, it is found the length and breadth of Britain and Ireland. Uh, it's one of our most successful native species and seems to have adapted to human activity and is widespread in the London area. Um, and is nearly always found in wetland habitats, but can actually grow in dry, drier ground as well. To the left hand side, I have uh, one of um, Britain's most iconic um, native tree species. This is black poplar, uh, much of which commentary is being made about it being a very endangered species, um, and it is certainly significantly threatened. It's not our rarest tree by a long mark that almost certainly would go to one of the sorbuses, some of which have only got 10, 15 individuals globally surviving. Um, there are probably several thousand black poplar surviving in um, Great Britain at the moment, um, but certainly in the London area, um, they are a declining plant. Um, these are plants which are largely associated with riverside habitats, um, a reasonably healthy population can be found at the Wildlife and Wetlands Centre down in Barnes, and there are other populations along the River Lee in East London. Curiously, the third area which you can also find, which is overlooked by many people, is actually in the Georgian town squares of Islington and Hackney and the adjoining boroughs because for some curious reason, in the late Georgian and Victor early Victorian period, this tree species seems to be quite popular to be planted in there. So several of these Georgian squares have actually got rather fine veteran trees of this species, sadly, some of which are gradually dying because of inappropriate management. And there's actually even a picture of King's Cross Station in about 1864. And in the foreground, you can actually see the branches of a black poplar. I just like to do a little bit on this momentarily about wildlife gardening and people's kind of urges and desires and what we can we do um, and what can they have. And here are two excellent wetland plants to put in your garden. Um, the one on the left hand side, Eupatorium cannabinum, um, is a widespread plant in South and West Britain uh, and is locally common in London, but is more or less absent from much of the northern part of London. Um, but does appear to be gradually increasing. This is a fantastic plant to adorn your garden, um, but is also really, really fantastic for wide range of invertebrates. And if you can tolerate it zooming around a little bit and you can get hold of this, the delightful Stachys palustris will also actually do a very nice things for your invertebrate community in your garden. This is a species which is nationally common, but in the London area seems to be largely restricted to the River Thames in, in the West and some of the river systems that feed into it. So it's now quite a local plant for us. Now, we can talk about for a little bit about the impact of human activity and tinkering with things. So this is a stretch of the River Thames um, in East London called Galleons Reach. In fact, it's actually very close to Tripcock Ness, which you can see in the upper right-hand side of this image. Um, and so often is the case we've got human impacts and human activities doing things which to varying degrees are not very well thought through or um, sometimes outright damaging. The bright yellow plant in the foreground is a odd subspecies of Gallium verum, our ladies bed straw, it's called subspecies Vertgenii, but is much, much more, it's much larger than our native plant. It's actually about, that's about a metre and a half high, that particular in those individuals there. These are very, very large plants indeed. Um, and the, the 
planting of things without forethought can actually cause negative impacts, but it also makes it very, very harder, for the, much harder for the botanical community to actually unpick processes and patterns if landscape managers don't as inform us of what their activities are. Oops. So sticking with um, impacts of unforeseen activities, I'm going to talk a little bit about invasive species. So here we have pale galingale. This is a specimen that I collected whilst I was still working in the Natural History Museum. I think this is only the second time I've seen it in the wild in Britain. This was some 20 odd years ago. Um, this is a species which is very closely related to one of the world's most severe invasive plant species. Um, and this is an emerging threat to our wetland and riverside habitats and, and the tidal Thames, I believe, in, in South East Britain. It seems to be uh, largely introduced um, accidentally through uh, bird seed. We quite often find founder populations of this growing by people's front gardens, near bird feeders, et cetera, et cetera. But we have now starting to find this plant uh, growing on the Thames foreshore in central London, uh, where it could play quite a serious, have quite a negative impact upon the existing ecosystems. Duckweeds um, are some of the trickier plants um, in Britain to identify. Um, they do take quite a bit of effort. I've used this slide many times over the years, but I'm now going to have to amend this because this image of least duckweed is probably fair to say Lemna minuta is a non-native species of duckweed, but we now have at least two others to add to the list. There's one called Valdiviana and another one called Turianifera to add to this. Now, in many ways, it just what's it matter? You know, these are actually little duckweeds. They're very similar to our native species. One of the things is we don't really understand the dynamics between these individual species. We are aware the duckweed populations go boom and bust, particularly in waters that are heavily polluted. So we've seen on canals in central London, some years the river, the canals will be heavily dominated by one species, such as Lemna gibber, which is quite widespread in London. Another year, Lemna minuta, and then another year, Spiradella, which is the largest species that we have. Um, we don't fully understand the dynamics of the species that we have already, let alone what may well be happening by these introduced additional non-native species. And the list of non-native invasive species is getting longer and longer, and partly through the un unregulated raid and, and trade in garden plants and people throwing plants out. Please never, ever do this. This is a little smorgasbord from a London pond um, down in the Surrey part of London. False Hampshire person is the big leafy thing in the middle. And then two of the most ser serious invasive plant species that we have in our aquatic and wetland habitats, Crassula helmsi, the little tiny, tiny green cross leaf thing, and Parrot's feather myriophyllum with the feathery foliage. These two species have played a significant part in actually the collapse in populations of plants such as brown galingale that I was talking about earlier on. <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> have some water, forgive me. We often tend to think of you know, urban habitats as being you know, different from the wider landscape or not particularly important. But urban habitats are extraordinary and unique in their own right, and they also hold populations of really, really valuable plants. Um, this is an illustration of Helios skyardum, um, the creeping marshal at Helios skyardum repens, which again, like Damazonium, is one of Western Europe's most endangered plant species. This was found uh, in, in, in Walthamstow marshes in East London, um, some 20 years ago, and it was the first population of this plant found in the London area. So we continue to make discoveries, even in very well documented um, parts of southeast England, such as London. Now, Helios skyardum, as I say, is very, very vulnerable to extinction. There are two populations in the Oxford area, um, one of which is a reintroduction, and two very, very recently discovered populations in East Anglia. But this is a species which is on the knife edge. It's a very small plant. It only grows usually two to three inches, and sometimes a little bit taller. It's a very small thing. 
And again, as a constant theme for many of these aquatic plants, it is not very good at dealing with competition from these larger, more robust species. Now I'm going to better speed up. I thought it was going to take so long. So it's not all gloom and doom. Um, that's been quite a gloomy talk. I do apologise, but it's fair to say our wetlands are not in a good state. Um, we have rescued marsh sow thistle, Soncus palustris. This is a species which I've been fascinated by the whole of my life, pretty much. Um, and we were able to rescue some seed from the last known population in the Greater London area, grow on some plants. Uh, and here's me planting out the young plants in a new donor site. I'm um, sorry, receptor site, and not far from the one where the last wild population is. And some 15 years later, I'm very glad to hear that these plants are now doing extremely well. And this nationally scarce but reasonably stable plant species is now doing very well in London once more. And we're looking at new sites to get this re-established and hopefully make it a little bit more widespread because it's an absolutely glorious beast when you see it in the flesh. And discoveries do keep continuing. This Bulbasurnus laticarpus is actually a close relative of the sea club rush, which is a widespread plant in the riversides um, and, and, and the salty environments of southeast England. This was actually discovered um, to be a new British species some, uh, some 10 years ago, partly through the observation skills of somebody in northwest London who found a population of this plant growing in some fields and thought it was a little bit odd. So uh, London botanists and recording plants in the London area is helping us give an understanding of the natural national picture. And this is now a well and now known to be accepted as a British species. Uh, and I will finish off saying stick with a bit of positivity. I mentioned earlier on uh, things about pondweeds, potamogetans. Um, as I say, um, there are group plants which I'm personally really fascinated in, but they've not been doing very well. But certainly this year we've had a good run for the pots because we rediscovered a population of a thing called Potamogeton lucens, which I hadn't seen for about a decade growing in the canal in East London, um, which made me dance a little bit. So I was very happy. And then about five days ago, uh, a visiting botanist from North Wales and I found a species called Potamogeton freesii, the flat stalked pondweed which hadn't been seen in much of London since the 1940s. So despite the doom and gloom, you can still find some wonderful and extraordinary plants in London's wetlands, canals, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Mark. That was really fascinating. Um, I'm just curious, just picking up um, on, on that Potamogetum freesii, What's yeah. the, what's what's kind of led that to be? I mean, is it? Do you think it's been overlooked and just been spotted, or has something happened that's actually kind of helped that plant? Um, to be honest, I'm really, really not sure um, because we just found it in King's Cross, and we found quite a lot of it. Um, and I know that piece of canal in King's Cross very, very well. I walked along it dozens of times, looking in gloomily muttering about the poor quality and the poor state of it um, and never seen it. As soon as I saw it the other day, I knew it was something different. Um, and I guessed within about a minute what species it was. And then we got it checked and validated by um, Chris Preston, who's the UK guru on Um So I think it's probably a recent arrival in the King's Cross area, possibly mm. through boats. Yeah. Through pleasure, pleasure boats. That's my best hypothesis. I've actually got to walk along the area and see if I can find that. We found it actually through an area about 200 metres of the canal um, by the coal yard, an area you'll know well. Um, yeah. So it was a great surprise because I've looked in there many times for something yeah. a little bit more exciting than pectinatus and found not much. Yeah, that, so that, anyway, that's an excellent find. That's yeah, it is. Best, actually, I don't think I don't think many people know about that. So you're yeah. you know, some of the first people to to hear that news, which is great. The only, um, we, we've got some questions already uh, in. Oh, yeah, that's great. We've got some questions already in the chat. And also if people have got questions that they'd like to ask in person, just do pop your hand up. So, Tony, if we go to the questions in the chat first and then I've got a couple of things that I'll ask, but I'll hang on. <laughs> I thought you might do. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll work backwards actually because it's an interest that first or well, the last question that came up was from Beverly Dean she asks about what can be done about the deterioration of Barbican Lake and do you have any idea as to why it might have gone? I mean I've noticed it myself and seen it change so dramatically um I I I, I hadn't actually been for a while quite well I, I was slightly reeling from shock at how bad it was because it was fantastic um, I think we probably do need to contact them. I maybe they're having to augment the water with non borehole water. Um, I did notice there was a huge amount of white bread being thrown in for ducks and stuff by you know passers by. Um, and also, and I don't recall this in the past, there were a very, very large quantity of large carp and carp in a lake like that can be very very damaging um not all carp but certain carp species because they tend to plow right into the bottom of the uh, uh mud and bring over them and make it very silty but yeah it's in a horrific state but they seem to be quite profound as i say i could see bubbles of methane coming up from the mud um so there's a there's a very significant problem that needs to be addressed it's very sad do you think it's something that we could flag, you know, I know we've got uh, the conservation officer and that, should we, should we do another little flagging up? Of I, I think it would be because I think it it's a really special site. Yeah. Um, it's one of the very few, well, it was, it was one of the very few places, places you could reliably find stoneworks in, in a London. Um, there's a small, small pond on the site, which bizarrely they've been dyeing with blue dye for some horrific mm. reason, uh, which still supports some carophytes. Um, so yeah, it's okay. Yeah, let's, think... let's, we'll, we'll follow that up then and see if we can at least sort of alert yeah. people. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Back to you, That's... Tony. There's another question. From, well, another question. What's one from Johnny, Jenny Morgan might take a little while to answer but she's asked can you advise on adaptations to the vestments to make a foothold for salt marsh plants and she asked that question in relation to surrey docks farm <laughs> and its enhancement are you <laughs> and uh, she yeah. mentioned san martins as well as a kind oh of a my god yeah i'm there yeah, are you possibly putting my hands into or head into boiling water on this because i'm aware <laughs> there's some complex politics around um EA management, um, Port of London management, and planting schemes around some of those. Um, it's a really, really complicated thing, which I'm not, I'm not being a coward because normally I will put my money where it, without actually seeing the, the specific piece of river wall and what's there, rec uh, I would be loath to actually specifically comment. But one thing I would say is personally, um, I'm not a fan of planting on a site like that. We should be going for natural colonisation. OK, very, very diplomatically put. Unusual for me. <laughs> um, and then there's another question from Linda Concannon, who's asking about an issue with Brent River Park. And she points out that there are a large number of amount of giant hogweed there yeah um, is there any or are there any projects in the area working to remove them i think that might be more generic question as well yeah i think again with giant hogweed clearly I've, I've been called to comment on this in press and media on multiple occasions over the last decade or so um we have the knowledge and techniques for managing giant hogweed populations it's actually technically mm. we pretty easy in its core um the critical problem is lack of resourcing. Um, and this is a national problem without putting proper resourcing for habitat management um, and for management of an invasive species like this, we're going to be stuck with the problem. Um, and it, this is a national issue uh, and local community areas such as Brent River Park, et cetera, et cetera, will never get on top of it until we address catchment level projects to deal with giant hogweed. Okay. okay, thanks for that. I'm just well, muting, leave, using someone. Um, there was a comment from Andrew Planet. He was making the point about duckweeds and the fact he was surprised, like I was as well, that there are so many alert around. Uh, yes, what can we possibly got... do to prevent repeating the mistakes we've already made? <laughs> Uh, again, we've got we've got we, we've got a pretty darn large toolkit of knowledge. You know, the critical things with our habitats is reducing pollution levels. 
you know uh, nitrate and phosphate pollution in most aquatic habitats is critical um, and is causing ecosystem collapse so that is the first and foremost thing you know um resisting the urge to get planting things all over the place um, we're seeing a lot of coir rolls going into various parts of the canal system in London. First, of which I'm not entirely convinced coir rolls themselves are brilliant because they actually increase the shading on the river, on the canal or river bottom, um, which is probably not good for submerged macrophytes. But critically, in many of these planted things, they're actually planting um, unsuitable and at times invasive species such as Mimulus or Erythranthi, as we should now be calling it, uh, the yellow monkey flower. Um, so there's things we dose definitely should be doing, you know, again, improving the core ecological processes and getting pollution out of the way of the main things with aquatic habitats. Um, and in some areas, probably desilting, um, but carefully and advisedly, not, oh, let's go a dredging. <laughs> I mean, I must say, I've seen a lot of these um, plantings along the canals yeah. which are, are interesting as, yeah. as an entomologist i find them interesting but i can <laughs> see why <it's, laughs> you may not yeah. be so keen on it yeah um, i mean, i think i think that some of the things are good but we could be doing a lot better one of the things is ironically is they put in planting schemes which don't actually reflect london's biodiversity you know they don't plant things like eupatorium they don't plant all the things which are actually key to our ecosystem function and actually the flora that's here already. Um, and yeah, so it's uh, mm, on that one. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to, love to see some more yellow loose drive around for, like, from Ab a European. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, that's, okay. that's a species which has declined quite a lot in the London area. Yeah, we've got a lot of it in Monston Park, but yeah. it's in these little clumps, but they're very vulnerable. They seem yeah. to grow in really vulnerable places to um, particularly conservation volunteers cutting them down <coughs> brutally um nora asks or states this focus has been on the thames but are the habitats along tributaries such as the wandle um which is part one and then she says have you or others aware of any work linking to the london borough of culture cycles not quite sure what that means but so in the first one the wandle so uh, the mighty Wandle, how dare I not mention the mighty Wandle? I mean, I did talk about the Brent, the Colne and the River Lee. Uh, I think one thing that's true about the Wandle, which is true about all the others, you know, as, as a key and important tributary of the River Thames is the Wandle has got massive potential for habitat restoration. One of the things that's holding the Wandle and the other tributaries, which have got reasonable structure, aside from pollution, is, are too many trees and too many shrubs. Most of London's smaller rivers and streams are dying because the aquatic plant life, the submerged aquatics are being shaded out by trees and shrubs. So if you have lots and lots of trees and shrubs along the whole length of a watercourse, which is what we have in most of our uh, river and stream systems in London, that cuts out the light across the whole length of it, which causes the submerged aquatic plants such as Ranunculus, Pertimagetans, Anakelia, and all these other genera to die out they are the bedrock of aquatic health and aquatic system health they are the places where the invertebrates hide breed and fish etc etc so most of london's rivers really really need to have some tree thinning and shrub thinning done in, along their length as well and the wandle is a good example actually where if that could be enacted haha -ha, again it's pots of money the health of the wandle would improve significantly. Do we need to go back to pollarding and so on? Would that be one way of I think doing for some it? areas, yeah. yeah. No, I think it's for some some places again, I think it is potentially, but I'm I'm more familiar with the, the streams in North London, but most of the streams in Harrow, et cetera, et cetera, they are dark, 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 and tiny, tiny relictual populations of and the Potomagetan crispus, which should be a common plant in London, is no means common anymore. And it's hanging on in tiny, tiny light wells in these streams. Um, but they will go fair at points. They are they are dwindling. Um, we're at a critical point where if we started to get our act together, we could improve the health of London's rivers and streams. Um, but we're probably going to fail. 
Oh dear. Okay, um, well, we never know. I mean, at least there's a, there's still a chance. So I there wouldn't, you know, I, I don't want to leave us to leave things on too negative. <laughs> so, Tony, I don't know if you want to pick up maybe one last question where we might kind of feed on a positive answer. I think there's lots of people who say it's been really interesting and in, that really enjoyed the talk and are pleased by the positive aspects. That's a, <laughs> but, but Cat's iPad has actually asked a question that I'm interested in as well, which is Himalayan balsam. <laughs> uh, Himalayan balsam is undoubtedly one of the most serious and severe invasive plant species in Britain and Ireland and much of Northern Europe or a large chunks of Northern Europe. Um, it, the evidence for negative impacts uh, across habitats, wide range of invertebrates, soil invertebrate community structure, um, soil structure, um, is very extensive. It's a very, very long list of oh dears, frankly, on this. But, you know, it is delightful and pretty and beautiful, um, but it is having very, very severe negative impacts upon plant life and invertebrate communities, despite some communities um, uh, believing that it is good for pollinators or a very small cohort of pollinators. Um, so, it's it's uh, it's one of our most problematic um, invasive species, and it's actually technically one of our hardest to deal with because the I've actually been an advisor on the biocontrol program for giant um, for Himalayan balsam, so I know quite a lot about it. it. Has quite a complex genetic structure in this country because it's come from multiple introductions along the Himalayan region. This is in marked contrast to say something like Japanese knotweed, which is the one that gets everybody's attention. Japanese knotweed is a single female clone, so we'll go down like nine pins if we find the right thing to deal with it. Whereas you've got a sexually dynamic, complex genetic environment with something like Himalayan balsam or Budlia for that matter, much, much harder to deal with. But yes, it is not an asset. Do you, do you I, do. Think the, I mean, I know in a lot of places people are pulling, you know, I think yeah. this is what, what kind of came yeah. up. I mean, does that eventually work? I mean, yes, it does. Yeah. It does. If you can get, and I mentioned the critical phrase earlier, if you can get a catchment level commitment. So by, by this, what I mean um, to kind of the wider listeners is if you've got a, a river system with streams at the top coming from the hills or, you know, the edge down to the main part of the river, you need to start at the top and work down. So you need to start at the top of the hill with your project of pulling, pulling, pulling. And the main reason for that is one of the main ways that Himalayan balsam is disturbed, dispersed is through flowing through water. So if your seed drops, if, they, if you get it at the top and work down, after several years, you can clear it. But that requires several years commitment. Luckily, Himalayan balsam seed, seed bank, as it's called, how long it lives in the soil is very short. It's only a year or two, if even less than that. So if you manage to keep it, take it all out in, um, in a given area, you can have a very high level of success. But it does require a lot of footwork and a lot of, of, of commitment. But it is doable and has been done in some catchments um, in Britain and Ireland. In other areas, it's just not practical. The, the problem is vast. I mean, you go through parts of, um, I go down through Hazelmere and places like that and Portsmouth, and there's just acres of it in some areas. So yeah, uh, it can work. Pulling can work. Um, uh, it's, it's harder to do in London because of the complex land ownership things. We have, you know, any individual piece of stream in London could have 20 landowners. You've got to get them to all participate and agree. So this is one of the great challenges for urban areas. Whereas if you've got a, a big Scottish estate with one landowner, you can actually go, right, yeah, we can get that person on board and we're going to tackle it in this area. So urban areas are much trickier for getting catchment level things to work. So I mean, interesting to see what happens on the hogs now, because obviously they're trying to work quite oh, are they? That's yeah, what's going to come through as a question. So, yeah, they yeah. need to, yeah, they do need to start right at the very top or as far up as they can get. And if they can't get to the top or the source of the hogs mill, they need to basically have a bit of a cordon sanitaire um, a, approach by keeping an eye on that intermediate zone. But yeah, if they do it for probably two to three years, they'll have very, very, and then keep on it really carefully for the next year, they'll have very high levels of success. Great. Okay. Well, good luck with that. Keep kind of keep going with yeah. that. Yeah. Look forward yes. to seeing that. 
Okay, so we are conscious we've run over a little bit, but it has been really interesting. So I hope um, everybody's kind of enjoyed it. It's just really nice, you know, nicely presented. I like the way we had that little bit about the what's that in vice counties as well to just kind of make that clear because that's something we can just assume everybody knows and it's really yeah. helpful. I think that'll be kind of useful in the recording as well. Thank you again, Mark, for. I just Sorry, I just wanted to say what somebody put up a thing saying that South Thistle's doing well at Deptford Creek. I'm very pleased to hear that. I've not been down there for a while, so that's great news. Oh, great. Yeah, no, that, that's great. Thank, yeah, thanks for popping that on. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for joining us this evening. Um, I, mean, I know this is the last of Mark's talk, but I'm so sure, sure of the Habitat talks, but I'm sure we can twist his arm and get him to come to talk to us again in the future, because there's plenty of other things that he can kind of tell us about. That I'm, uh, and we, I always enjoy your talks, Mark. They're all really, really informative and well presented. So thank you again. Thanks to everybody for joining us. We do have a couple of things on this weekend. So if you are in the London area and want to join us on one of the field meetings, on Saturday, George Hanson, who's here, I think, this evening, is leading a walk on Bagshot Heath, um, which is just to the sort of south in the Surrey area. So that should be really interesting. So do come along to that. And it's going to the... rain all day. Oh, well, anyway, it'll still be good fun. <laughs> Don't worry about the weather. Um, and then uh, this might get a bit affected by the weather. So um, and this, so uh, Neil Anderson is leading a walk in Ricelet Woods, looking mainly at the uh, wooden butterflies, but also general natural history. Now, that's one where you'll see in the programme, you contact uh, Neil the night before if we do have a really bad forecast because obviously butterflies are not going to be great in the rain but the plants will still be there so we can still go and enjoy those on Bagshot Heath so if you're in the area please do join um, one of those obviously you can't join both but please do join one of those and then our next virtual talk is on the 8th uh, no, sorry on the 10th of August Thursday the 10th of August and that's going to be a talk about peregrines uh, by Natalie Mayhew who's done um, a great deal of kind of observing and studying the peregrines or Fulham um, for a long period of time and she's going to tell us all about you know where they come where they come when they arrive what they're doing there and how, what their kind of future hopefully holds for them as well so please do um, sign up for that if you haven't already we hope to see you again all very soon if you want to unmute yourself to say goodbye Mick, sorry Maria one more quick thing you oh. you've you omitted um we've got a LNHS botany and BSBI walk at Munken Munken Hadley in the north on the Hertfordshire border on the 22nd of July as well. Yeah, that's coming up. So do, yeah, I mean, basically have a look at, um, the, have a look at our programme. Um, I think the Scion Park walk should be great as well, which is coming up in August. So you can come, kind of come along to all of them, any and all of them. But if you have a look at the programme on our website, you'll see there's a calendar. It shows you everything that's happening. But yeah, th that would be a really great trip as well. Be interesting sight to see um, sort of what survived there. So anyway, thank you very much, everybody. Do unmute yourself to say goodbye.